Great. Well, um, first thing up is approval of the previous month's minutes. I was not here. Thank you so much, Catherine, for leading that meeting. Um, so do, from somebody that was here, uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve. Thanks. Uh, a second? And it looks like Catherine's seconding. So, uh, minutes from last month approved. And I'm not sure if I need to sign or Catherine does. Um, I think it's okay if I do. I don't know. Let's do that. Sign this for and then if not, we'll, uh, we'll read it. Members of the public here, uh, so we'll move on now to <laughs> just <look> like <laughs> to new business. Um, and Heather, I think you volunteered to do our monthly icebreaker, so thank you. Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoy Thanksgiving if you celebrate, and a little time off if you don't, uh, hopefully. And um, one thing my family does every night at dinner, we do a quick little check in. A rose, a thorn, and a bud. Um, metaphors, of course, for the English teacher. So, if you, I was just going to invite you to share, kind of reflecting at year's end, a rose from your year. If you'd like a thorn, you don't have to. That might not be what you want to say, but either way. And then a bud, something you're looking forward to in 2024. So, I can go first, or someone else, if you feel so moved, can go. I think if you don't mind, like give us yeah. a moment. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, let's see. I put this in my holiday letter, actually. My rose from the year was this like a dorky law school thing, but um, the Hell versus State of Montana case. Did any of you follow the kids who took on the state of Montana? Um, I get, they basically, Montana has a constitutional right to a healthy environment, oh, and yeah kids sued the state because the state was giving a lot of deference to extractive industries and so they sued the state saying hey you're not protecting the environment for our futures and they won so it was a big deal yeah it was a long time coming you know some of the kids were like two when the case started and of course there were many different stalling tactics along the way so they're like some of them are adults now <laughs> they they were youth when they, you know, started out, but I just found it really encouraging and I'm getting involved in the, um, it's called a green amendment. So trying to have a right to, you know, a stable climate, et cetera. Um, I'm getting involved in a movement to try and get that on the Colorado ballot. So um, yeah, it inspired me this year. And um, my thorn was definitely getting COVID twice in a row this fall, that was torture. Um, and my bud is, I'm going to be quitting teaching this spring, so my last semester of full-time teaching in the classroom for 20, is going to be this spring semester, so. And it's like a kind of a bud, and we also do a fungus, something you're dreading. You don't have to do a fungus, but it's sort of a bud and a fungus <laughs> for 2024. Ah, thank you. That's a great question. I've, I've heard of Rose and Thorn, I've never heard of bud, before, and I like fungus as well. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, uh, Rose, for us, just on a personal note, we've been working on our backyard for what feels like forever. And finally, like, got the deck in, got some, like, grass in, so it's functional. So that was a big rose. I'll say a third was the uh, results of the Longmont ballot measures. Um, I mean, for the library as well as, I was really hoping for the uh, Performing Arts Center. And a bud to look forward to is just yeah hoping for some good travels and get back into hiking this year so looking forward to that and i'll pass to whoever wants to go next um i'll go next so for going off of the travel probably that would be my big rose for the year was i got to go to a couple countries which is um, the most i've ever done before so i was um, glad to be able to have those experiences 
Um, Thorne, I'll repeat Catherine's, I also got COVID twice in a row after. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was no fun this year. Um, and then probably fun for next year is I'm having friends uh, reach out from out of state saying that they're gonna come visit. So looking forward to that for next year. I can go next. I, I don't know who all is in the room, um, so, but I'll go. <laughs> so my rose is, um, I was selected or, um, by the city council to be mayor pro tem. So I was very excited about that. <laughs> wow. um, yeah, I was like, yeah. Congratulations. So it, it was, thank you, thank you. Um, Thorn is, right now I'm at home with a respiratory infection. Uh, my eye is actually better this morning. It was just a little slit and it was really swollen. So I think all the, you know, with the antibiotics, I'm kind of flushing it all out. Um, I have not been this sick since COVID and it's been lingering on for about three weeks now. So, and my kids, I had seven out today, no, six out today, seven out Friday and yeah, it's just, it's bad. <laughs> so, so the sickness stuff, it's, that's a thorn. Um, a bud, so my daughter is, um, she lives in Phoenix. She's actually decided to study law. So she, currently she had stepped away from school. She decided to go back. Um, so she's just going to the, you know, she's going to the community college there, but she'll be transferring to ASU next year, and she's studying law. So that is like, I'm living vicariously through her right now. <laughs> I'm very proud of her. So she's she's overcome many obstacles, and I'm just proud of the young human being she's become. So yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. <coughs> <laughs> the few of us left are looking and, around. And just so, <laughs> just so y'all know, if you can't see, who's in this room is myself, Cynthia, Jamie, John, and Tracy, as well as our Longmont public media representative. Um, so that, that is who you were talking to. Go ahead, Tracy. Sure, I'll go next. <laughs> My Rose and Thorn are kind of in the pet same package because we've had car troubles for the last, oh. I don't even know how many years. And our last car, which was a Subaru, which should have been really good, but we got it from Pennsylvania and had a lot of rust, unfortunately, um, kind of just quit on us. And so I commute from Fort Collins. It's definitely a need for us to have a car. So it was a big struggle in the moment. And my dad blessed us hugely by just buying us a brand new car. So that was a huge rose <laughs> for us this year, finally, to not have to stress about that. Um, and so it was just a huge blessing and not have to worry about it um, and then bud I would say is just going to actually visit family this next year um, and then also celebrating my mom's um, 60th birthday and my grandma's 80th birthday <laughs> um, all in one kind of big party so looking forward to those I'll take the plunge why not <laughs> I'm in a weird headspace tonight so this is actually challenging me it's um Interestingly, it's an exercise that my family has done for probably 10 years at least around the dinner table, and we still do it. And we come up with our own stuff to add to, which is funny. Um, I'm used to doing it about my day. So when I think about the whole freaking year, my gosh. You know what? Um, I got to do a lot of neat stuff this year for the first time, like try different things, volunteer in different capacities. I'm not like, I'm not making this up. I think that being a part of this board and a part of this work and my work with the friends and uh, I volunteer in the Central Elementary Library, like those have definitely kept me afloat um, and connected me to something that I have a passion for. Um, so yeah, those were highlights to my year. Getting to participate in a, um, an election in the way that I did, you know, actually, 
I think I was more informed about the issues and the candidates and everything going on in Longmont and Boulder County than I'd ever been. I mean, this is my second year in Colorado, so it took me a minute. My, my thorn, um, I also tried to do some neat stuff that didn't quite pan out. Um, so my thorn is gonna be tied to my bud in that I am hopeful that the next year brings new opportunities and um, kind of new paths for me. I guess that leaves me. Yes, it does. <laughs> and, and just as a reminder, we're always welcome to pass. I, no, no, it's fine. Totally, yeah. Um, so, uh, in all cases, this, this is all very personal for me. I mean, there, there certainly work things that um, are tied into this. Um, I think everyone, or at least most everyone, knows that when I started here last year, um, <clears throat> my wife had passed away a week before. Um, and so my, what is it, Rose? My, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've made it through this first year, I guess, is my Rose, you know, I mean, <clears throat> and, and a lot of that has to do with Longmont and the people here um, and everything about it, you know, has, has kept me, my family, of course, my wife's family in particular, actually. So I'm, you know, there's, I, I try to keep a positive spin on things. That's something that came from Lori, if you knew her. Um, so my thorn is that she's still not freaking here. So, you know, that's going to be my thorn every year for as long as I can see without, that goes without saying. Um, but my butt is I'm still here. I'm talking to everybody. I did make it through a year. I wasn't really sure what this first year was going to bring, um, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm here to tell about it and in this year, I've done some things for her. I've spread some ashes in some places that I wanted to do for her. So, um, so you know, there's uh, I'm holding on to those things that, that keep the good memories there. Well, thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I really wish that we were sitting around the table. If you drink, having a drink right now, <laughs> rather than continuing on with business, no, but. I think I really appreciate uh, the question um, and everyone's responses. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Moving on. Um, the, the next item I put on was I wanted to talk a little bit about sustainability in, in the future and I think that this can be a continuing conversation so of course we don't have to have it all right now. Um, but I, I wanted to pose the question is what is going to be sustainable for the library going forward and I'm I'm thinking particularly in the short term um, now that we know the will of the voters with that ballot measure earlier this year as well as learning that the budget will stay the same which in my mind is a cut with the collections budget increasing um, I think that uh, in my time on this board, I've just been blown away by the commitment of the staff here and how much they're doing. And you know, John, from our conversations, um, burnout is a concern I would have um, just because there is so much that everyone here is doing. Um, so John, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Um, and like I said, I just hope this is a continuing conversation. And, and Susie is our liaison, and uh, I was gonna ask you a little later during your um, report but if you're I'm not sure if you'll continue to be our liaison in the new year or not but um, just just any any ways that we can get this information to council that um, there might I don't know there might need to be some things that change in the short term but John I'll pose that to you first because I'm not sure if that's actually the case yeah I, Noel I, I mean I think it is you know the, the, the staff here long before me have um, just been tremendous in what they provide um, at a level that's way above what I think anything is realistic for a staff of this size for the city of this size honestly and everyone just works tirelessly um, and that's with you know programming and services we do 
Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, for the benefit of retaining good staff, you know, and not burning them out, I, I don't, I don't know. At least going forward, in the, in whatever it's going to look like, certainly in the next year, but and maybe beyond, you know, if we can really sustain that without losing good people, um, and what does that look like? I don't have exactly that answer. Um, you know, I, I, I could, just thinking about the sheer number of programs that we do in a year between children and adult um, and outreach, which I'll talk to specifically in a second, but um, I don't know. You know, the, we, we may have to really take a, a deep look. That's something I'm talking with my leadership team here and really prioritize and make some um, uh, a, a previous boss of mine would call forced choices. You know, so what, what what do we prioritize and what can we let go, at least for now, in order to maintain sanity here? You know, I think people have plugged along all along thinking there's some future here of support, and it was twofold, right? The voters had a say, and then the city didn't do anything for my budget. So, you know, it, it's like the, the knife was turned a little bit, so that hurts. Um, <clears throat> For outreach specifically, and I probably said this before, um, but you know, it, it's a it's a department of one, and my priorities for my budget requests, and as well as the election, were to support that new department and really get out there in long run um, and continue to make the difference that that Lillian is making. And you'll get to meet her at some future meeting here. She'll come here um, if you haven't met her. But she's fantastic, but you know, that, that candle's burning. And so I'm talking with her probably more than anybody in, in this kind of prioritization and forced choices, like what, what needs to go so that you know, it's, it's something that she can continue to do without burning completely out and we're left with nothing, which would even be worse. So you know, these are um, things on my mind in that sense um, when I think of sustainability. Some is going to be a matter of fact collections you brought up, and I, I see your hand, Catherine. Just one second, <laughs> while I ramble. Um, but um, with, with collections, the, the biggest thing there, and that I tried to budget for, is when I started here, we were just starting in pre-processing materials, right? We didn't do that before here. We had staff that did all the physical labor of jacketing and stickering books. Now we pay for it as a part of. Um, getting the books in, which is still a way better decision because it gets materials on the shelves much faster. It streams lines, everything regarding that. However, that comes at a cost. So without a budget increase to collections, it effectively means a cut because we have to pay for that pre-processing through that collection budget. And that's across the board. Right. So that'll mean less adult books, less children's books um, than we've had in, in any year previous until we can get that resolved. And it may not be immediately obvious to a lot of people, but you know, think about for sure things that we would normally do, like you know, a, a top selling author that has a new book out that everyone wants that we would probably buy a minimum of 10 copies of, we're probably gonna have to cut that in half or maybe just buy a few and rely on the consortial borrowing to fulfill that. So that'll hurt at some point. Okay, Kathy. <laughs> This is just a quick question, and Susie, you might know the answer, but did prior to you meeting and getting the information that your budget was not being increased, did our letter go out to council? Yeah, I sent the letter yeah. out. Sorry, Susie. Right. And I mentioned it as well during our um, council comments. Okay, so our, our um, attention plea fell on deaf ears. All right. Um, well, I mean, it's a process it's a process so we cannot just at you know we had our um our our or, um, organizational meeting so we had the election we had our organizational meeting where we were assigning um positions you know for liaisons and so the the last meeting we had where we did the reorganization there wasn't any major business to be conducted. 
and then this last one was just kind of filling in past um, ordinances and readings that we that we had to hear prior to the election that were on the docket. Um, so I'll, I'll continue more during our um, our council our um, my council update. But um, I don't think it fell on deaf ears. It's just going to be a process in how how we can relook at relook at things and really what's going to come up to council for a vote. It sounds like right now a lot of the stuff was and John, you can correct me if we do have something we can kind of uh, get in there. Uh, you know, I think if we look at reallocation of funds. Um, I don't know if we have all of council's support on that, but um, but a lot of it is Harold. So Harold decides where I support it when we've already voted on our budget. So then there's like there's reallocation of funds. There's um, oh gosh, what is it? There's a word for it. It's not reallocation of funds, um, and I can't. It's escaping me right now. I'm, Taking a lot of cold things and so I totally empathize. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I've had conversations. It sounds like, you know, there's some things that are organizational, and there's some things that will be come to us as a policy. Does that make sense? And I'll I'll get into more detail when we when I bring up my council update because I have some ideas. Okay, I just wanted to clarify in terms of John's sharing, yes, feeling about it that we were given a hard no after they read our letter. I no, there was no hard no. There was no like they they took it in by Harold though. I mean, the letter never went to Harold, or Harold didn't get. I don't know. I'm just curious about the timeline, kind of how it all. So so I will I will share, and then John and Susie, please let me know if I'm wrong. My understanding is that. Um, the budget news was to communicated prior to our meeting, um, and then thank you all for uh, working on that letter. I sent that out after y'all met. I CC on my communications, so I sent it to council, um, and then I CC on the city manager. I'm going to get the title wrong. The assistant city manager, as well as the head of this department, so Jeff. Um, it just kind of as a matter of course, um, and so. It sounds like to me that just nothing changed, like right after that. Is that, am I getting that timeline correct on as far as you know? Pretty, pretty much. I mean, the only slight difference there as far as Harold and the city goes is I believe um, I had met with him before mm -hmm. the letter went out, mm -hmm. and, and that's when I was told that my budget wouldn't be changing. And, and just to echo what, what Susie was saying, the, the budget had went to council as it was without, the, without any changes to the library that was voted on. Mm -hmm. And so me coming to Harold after the election is after hoping that there was something that could be, well, I'll use Susie's term, uh, reallocated, <laughs> because I don't know either. But, um, you know, and that's where I was told that there's really no movement there. And then I believe your letter went on after that. Now, I haven't received any communication, at least personally, from the city or anybody in that sense. Um, and and then, as Susie stated, you know, they, they haven't had meetings where they could address that yet anyway. Hey, well, thanks for clarifying that. Thanks for asking that question, Catherine. I think it's to know that timeline. Uh, Susie, I think that we'll just continue. I, I, like I said, I, I think this is an ongoing conversation. I'm thinking towards our next communication to council, uh, which is probably going to be, you know, I'd like it to be at least early spring. What, what, what format that is, I think we can decide whether it fits a, a communication like we passed last time, council invite to be heard, or, or so on. Um, but I think that Whatever our next communication is, and that's, you know, our scope as an advisory board is to make that communication, um, that, I, that I think it could be based on this, this continuing conversation. Um, it's really easy for me to, to suggest that, you know, services be dropped because I know the nature of this work, uh, that if you're not doing something, somebody's missing out. 
you know, it's the same across education as well. Um, and since I'm not an employee here, it's easy to say that from the outside. Uh, but I just really want, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I want John to know also that he is, uh, I'm not going to speak for the board, but he is my supporter in that, like, sometimes things need to drop if they're not being supported, um, which is a really hard thing to say. Um, and so I just hope that, like, I said this can be on, ongoing, so I plan to add this to old business uh, when appropriate in the next few months. May I add one yeah. thing? Um, speaking in my role as liaison to the Friends of the Library, I've been thinking about this question a lot, certainly you know, from before the election, really, and then all the way up through till now. And I just came out of a weekend where uh, you know, the Friends were putting on their quarterly or seasonal uh, book sale and um, volunteered quite a bit. Um, I love doing that. It gives me joy. It puts me in contact with the community. Um, sort of fills my cup with this kind of work. And because of what happened with the election and with the budget, I was so acutely aware of not only how much work this group of volunteers does, um, but the uh, not sustainable nature of it. Specifically, you know, I can say more about the Friends when that part of the agenda comes along, but in regard to library sustainability, the amount of money that the Friends raises for the library and what it covers, i.e. operational costs, program costs, um, I would be very, very sad to hear that any council members or anyone um, with the city um, thought, oh, well, the Friends fill that gap so we don't have to try harder. This is a group of largely uh, folks over 60. Um, I've sat around a table with the board members and heard them talk about you know, how one bad fall may take them out of volunteering. So in terms of legacy planning for that group, you know, they have their own work cut out for them in terms of recruiting uh, members um, and some other organizational stuff. However, the fact that we're all relying on this group of volunteers, they, it, the, it's so physically laborious to go through those, can collect those donations, sort them, get them up here, put them out, move them around, get them out of here. It's a little, um, I'll just be transparent, I'm a little ashamed that, um, our city is okay with this. It's, it's quite a big chunk of what keeps the library going and allows for all of these wonderful, innovative programs that we, we do offer. Um, going into next year, if we're not going to, uh, oh, the other thing is that it's not, it's, it's not reliable, right? You, you can't predict how much money you're gonna bring in in a given month or a given year from selling the used books or the bookshop. It's, you can estimate, but you can't really know. So you can't really budget for what the friends are gonna bring in. So going into next year, I would just like to revisit the aspect of the conversation that I may have missed before I joined, um, which is around what fundraising avenues are available to us because we are, um, under the city, I don't know how that works. Um, is it, are the friends the only avenue that uh, we can use? Um, what would be involved in setting up a foundation? On and on and on. What are just the options? Even if they will require work, I would rather think of a way to put some energy toward that um, because. It, I feel like we, we run the risk of going off a cliff. If something, it it's, would not take much 
to uh, to derail everything that the friends is doing right now. And in that instance, I fear that the library would be in a a very tricky position. Thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate that context, and I think it's incredibly important to keep in mind. Um, there were some brief conversations. Catherine might have a better memory uh, of looking at into what what does why don't we what is a foundation for the library? Why don't we have one? What does it take to set up? Um, I can look back. Tracy might need your assistance, so I can look back at some of our notes. I think that would should be a good conversation to have in the spring. I'm also interested to hear about how the museum fundraising is going. Um, and uh, I just want to add from my perspective as well, it is amazing what the friends have provided. You talked about, um, you know, that there might like one bump could derail that organization. I'll just add, um, I think it's really important for the library to be making the calls who, who is, is coming, who is not coming, what speakers are coming, who is not, um, and not having a volunteer organization make some of those decisions. I don't think they are. Mm. Don't we have to, I mean, they always say say yes so far, but don't you submit requests to them for a purchase? If, if we need funding, right. yes, they have to approve it and yeah. uh, the funding. Um, to my knowledge, it's never been. It's never, no. no. Right. But, but, but technically, you're right. So if, if we need funding for an author to come in and for some reason a friend doesn't have it, Mm -hmm. or for you know or disapproved of it yeah, some something then then we would either have to find a different way or not proceed that's right. technically true yeah so i think and i just know for the friends yeah part because i go to all their board meetings too is they just want to help this yeah. library yeah. yeah they they want to say yes to as many things the only reason why they might say no is if they didn't have the money that's the only reason yeah. they do yeah yeah I mean, they're willing to, to support things financially that really they, sh they yeah. shouldn't be, yep. yeah. you know. And I think about the hours they put in and that it's free labor, and yep. I, I don't want to take advantage of them either. Yeah. Right. Um, but, yeah, you're right. That boundary is a little... It's a little shaky. I mean, not with this group, but I'm thinking, you know, in the future. Um, yeah, turn it, over. It, right. What if the friends did change over? Yeah. That dynamic could change. Right. Right. Because it's the, there is some power in, in having the purse strings. Yeah, yeah. Technically. Yeah. And anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about thinking them. I think once we get to the reports and information items. Before we move on for, for this agenda item for now, John, is there anything you'd like to add, or is there anything anyone else would like to add? For me, I think for for this current meeting, I think I've said what I wanted to. Thanks. That looks like right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just curious to clarify. When I first started, we also had kind of like another staff member, and it sounds like we sent that person the letter as well. Um, but I was wondering with some, maybe some of the city processes or discussions, like I don't know if that was like temporary to have that person sit in these meetings as staff or be a part of the orientations to bring us on or if that's something next year that we want to have someone from the city whether the same role or a different role be a part of these meetings to have kind of like that understanding or be a part of like hearing uh, when we're contributing to things like putting the letters together or just expressing our support or because I know it's super helpful to have John and Susie and folks from the city here but if we maybe need um, another role or staff member to have a better on the city side for them to kind of better understand what the library is going through I'm not sure if like bringing another person in would be useful in kind of making that happen so that, yeah are you thinking of Jeff sorry yeah, I think you're speaking of Jeff, who is um, the head of, I'm going to get the Recreation Department of Culture. Recreation and Culture. So at us, the He's museum, my boss. Jeff, John's boss, the uh, rec side, the golf courses, all that stuff. I, I, in my understanding, funnels up to Jeff. Um, I think that's a great idea um, to see if we could have this conversation in a meeting he could attend. I don't know if that's a possibility, John, or. Um, oh, yeah. All right. Just, just with some notice. All right. Jeff, and then if it's relevant, I mean, we, we tossed around some ideas here and there before about maybe it was a little bit 
related but unrelated, but having someone from the city attorney's office here because yep. we we're discussing something very specific mm -hmm. that where that might have been relevant. That might be also what Rihanna you're getting at, where we've kind of talked about that, um, or other other city officials where it might might be relevant to have them here. But certainly with enough with notice, that's generally possible. I know some assistant city managers have attended some other boards and commissions when when requested. So Jeff's bosses. <laughs> that's a really great suggestion. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, so I'm going to try to, I think we have a few things to talk about in the spring. Um, I'll try to plan out our agendas a little further in advance so we could get the right people here for those conversations. Then, Catherine, I think you had had your hand up. I did. I'm trying to remember what I was thinking about. Um, oh, I just wanted to echo Jamie's point um, in terms of the reliance on the friends and just say that for the five years I've been on this board, it's been an ongoing point of pain and um, gratitude, of course, but also just embarrassment. And why can the city not see that? I don't, I don't understand. It seems very confusing. Susie has her. Yeah, thanks, Susie. Do you have any anything to add to that? Yeah. So you know, some of the ideas that I have been thinking about, and you know, I know that we put in for grants for mental health for different. You know, we have a lot of ARPA dollar coming in, um, opioid money. Um, you know, uh, di different sources or pots of money coming in from the federal and state but probably the federal. But I'm thinking about opportunities where we have, not for the library, but for other departments, where it might free up some dollars. You know, so I'm kind of, you know, wanting to look at that, where if they put in for a grant for something that we have maybe initially thought we would be funding, you know, it kind of puts that money, it's like, okay, well, not that it's extra money, but if a grant is covering a certain program, I'm thinking of core or leads team, how can we kind of manipulate things to kind of move funding from one source to another? And I, I think that would be kind of taking an avenue of general fund where, you know, maybe general fund dollars that would be going to, to public safety if they've received a grant for X amount of dollars, maybe that X amount of dollars from general fund could actually try to go towards the library, if that makes sense. So trying to, try, try, try to create a creative approach. The other thing, um, you know, and I, talk, I spoke with Harold about this, and I was very upset with the idea of cutting children funding. Um, and you know, not to, to punish adults, but it was really adults who made the decision that they don't want to fund the library. So I think, <laughs> okay, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard because people who have participated, I can see, I saw in some of the pictures, friends of mine who took some of those classes, I think there was one that was like little books, the ear, earrings or one class, you know, so there are people who are passionate about the library who want to attend and participate in these programs, but I'm thinking of the two, you know, it's it's our youth. I mean, we're really, when I had a chance to have a debrief with the Youth Council, they were very disappointed to hear about the library. The performing arts and the library, I think, were the two that they were most upset about. That, um, you know, the library serves as a great equalizer people who don't have access to books or don't have access to quality technology um, and it's usually our um, low socioeconomic status individuals and I see what it will do to our kids in the future you know right now we're trying you know one of the things I talked to Harold about after that incident that happened at Countryside Mobile Home Park the drive-by I don't know if you all heard about that Yep, those are my those are our families that go to Indian Peaks. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, you know, the next day we were here in the next couple of days, even today, you know, kids are traumatized. So what are some ways then that maybe we won't have a brick and mortar facility, but how we can create some kind of library, mobile library? And I've heard that idea kind of be thrown around before, but maybe let's look for a resurgence of that and how we can set up satellite stations. I'd really like to see one in that community room over there at Campside Village. I'll run it. I hope you don't have to pay me. I'll do it. But um, if, you know, so kind of getting a little creative where maybe it's not as expensive to oversee as opposed to building a ground up brick and mortar branch, but how we can get these services out to community and and really keep the youth portion going. Um, and and then, you know, I kind of, I'm still talking to Harold about, okay, well, if we, we get this money, you know, for public safety, or if we get this money for, you know, open space, or how can we kind of free up some dollar that could make its way back to library? I think the capital campaign, I was trying to look up the last numbers I got for the museum was um, 6.5 million. And that was as of November 6th. So that was prior to the um, Colorado Gibbs. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm sure it's more now. But, um, you know, and then looking at, at how we can create a, a foundation. That would be another option where people who really want to, to see this can help contribute. It's tricky, right, Susie? Um, I hear you on the grants front. My mind is kind of going in that direction too. And I work for the county. Um, and I don't know if you know, <laughs> following what's happening to, to the county budget and public health got slashed. Um, and we're uh, trying to figure all that out right now, um, heading into next year. But there's always the conversation where I'm working right now around grants and that you can't really count on that long term either because there's no guarantee. You know, if you get a grant for three years, five years, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get that grant again. So I would worry about, you know, reallocating money from like uh, the police or health and safety, uh, public safety, and um, that would be awesome. And what if that department doesn't get that grant again? Would the library have to give that money back? So that's one question um, with that piece. Also, I don't know, John, I've worked in libraries where a lot of the youth programs beyond story times cost money. Yeah. And that's how, they, that's how the library could fund craft and you know, uh, musicians and puppets and all of that is like, it was $5. Um, and I, I think that would be a really sad direction for this library to go to because of the, uh, the accessibility, inclusivity angle. Um, yeah, it's just so hard. Oh. Yeah, thanks for those points. Catherine. Okay, maybe I'm just being stubborn. But I feel like even having this conversation is just letting the city off the hook for not providing a basic service it owes to its citizens for the tax dollars we put into the pot. And I 100% believe it's a responsibility that a city has similar to education and preschool and all the things we should be providing for, edu for children as part of their education, but also for adults and for all the reasons we all know. And I just feel like saying, we should have a nonprofit pay for, it's like saying we should have a nonprofit provide us with our water, like, or our power. This is a city, this is like, in my mind, is the same thing as a utility. It's a responsibility government officials have to its citizens to provide a functioning library. And we've been told by the city's own study that we're not doing that. So I personally, I love how creative you all are, but like, I just feel like, no, they should fund the library. I agree with you too, Catherine. Like, that's in another reality where things, everything made sense, 
The Friends would be fundraising for all of these expansion and innovation ideas, a mobile library, satellite, and the city would pay for the things that the Friends are paying for, right? Because your, your friends, yeah. the other Friends groups I've worked with, they raise money to further the mission, not to just kind of meet the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Right. And the city doesn't want to lose the library, its crown jewel that everybody loves. They won't let us become a district, but they won't fund it. It's kind of one or the other in my mind. You can't keep saying, like, hey, you can't go be a library district. We love you so much. And then it's a bait and switch. Like, we love you so much. Yes, please stay. But we're not going to actually fund your programming. I think that one of the points that I would like to con to continue to raise with the city is exactly what you did, that this is a, this needs to be considered an essential service. And it hasn't been for a number of reasons. Um, and so what is our role within this, um, which I think is to continue to communicate that, that this needs to be an essential service. Um, and we need to, it sounds like there's some ideas for appropriate uh, staff, city staff to come in to hear that as well. Um, so I really think that those are important points that you're raising. Um, and I would like to, to let that uh, kind of set the, the framing of, of, our, of our conversations um, because this is an essential service in my mind as well, and I think in all of our minds. So, um, okay, well, I think that we have discussed this as much as we can tonight, but I would like to just open up one more time for final comments on this issue before we move on to uh, our old business. I don't. All right, we'll continue the conversation. I was also taking notes uh, just in terms of a strategy for next year. Um, and like I said, we'll continue in 2024 with this um, as appropriate. Right. Uh, action plan update is our only old business item, and I'll turn it over to John for that. Okay, so I, um, <clears throat> I won't fumble around and bring up the dashboard. I'll just talk through the action plan, um, where, where we stand with that. So a couple of items on there that I wanted to do this year was form a couple of committees, one of selectors, those are the various staff that actually do the purchasing for our collections throughout the library. It's, it's um, many libraries do this in a centralized form, but we have it throughout each department. So children's staff choose children's books, adult staff choose adult materials, what I should say. Anyway, I form these committees to um, create a little more cross-departmental knowledge of what's going on with selection, but also some larger items within selection in particular that impact the library overall. And the biggest thing that's come out of, of these meetings of recent is um, really discussing challenges, right, to our collection, censorship kind of stuff that this library, fortunately, hasn't really faced too much of. Um, at least since I've been here. However, you always need to be prepared, and what we've discovered as a selection committee is that our, our process, even and just even down to the form the, that someone would fill out and submit to challenge an item or items in our collection is a little bit out of date and needs rewriting. So there's been some real good progress in this that'll continue a little bit in rethinking about how we approach this and in some ways thinking about worst case scenarios so that we're prepared to handle something a little bit better than we are now. Um, I'd rather be set up for that. So we've been doing a lot of research into other libraries in Colorado, in particular on how they manage challenges um, and kind of taking note of that and seeing what we want to implement here. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, currently here, anybody, anybody, can challenge something in our collection. And I say that because many libraries um, restrict that to being minimally a resident of the city that we serve, or the, the what we would call a library land service population, right? Because in Longmont, it's easy. 
it's, we serve the long, city of Longmont because we're a municipality. If you are a county or a district, it would be different. Um, we don't really have anything written that states that we restrict that. And I, I, I feel, and the committee feels strongly that we really should um, in that sense. If, if you really want to go as far as to question something in our collection or programs that we do or something even on display, you need to live in Longmont. Um, and then other items too, like should we take that a step further and require that they have a library card as well? Um, and many libraries do this, and many libraries require both now. Some libraries are taking this even com in a completely different direction, and they've taken away any form you fill out, and if you want to challenge something, you have to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the director. <laughs> and you have to prove that you read the book, or whatever it is. Um, so interesting how other people are approaching this. Um, so I, I could go on, I just want to let you know that's one of the results of that committee that I think is really good for this library and Longmont. I mean, we, we obviously talk about other things selection-wise, but a lot of it is data-informed and how we are choosing what to take out of the collection, what we should be adding, and having common practices and how we evaluate that, which we don't have. Like, from what I can tell, and that's a, a, another benefit of forming this this type of thing this past year is to realize that you know what what maybe for example children's staff do to evaluate what they need to keep or remove from the collection might vary very differently from what adult services does, and in some case that might make sense. It's going to be different removing picture books, for example, as opposed to mysteries. Right, you know, your criteria might be different, but there's also some commonalities. Anyway, that was a long explanation of that. Um, the other committee I formed was for programming, so we could talk about, um, and, and again, cross departmental within the library, but even bigger than that, within recreation and culture, thinking about cross departmental programming, what are we doing as a big department? We haven't really touched that level, but at least in the library, really having a better understanding of what everyone's doing with programming, where we even internally could do cross-programming, adult and, and children, right, in particular. Um, so sharing ideas like that, but a couple of big things that have come out of this committee was really in how we promote our programs and how we um, get that out. So one of the first steps we did is um, the recreation, of course, um, there's the camera. Um, you know, you've all seen this, you probably get it in the mail, the rec guide, right? So the library has not had a presence in here in a number of years. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to do is make sure we have a presence. So now we have a page. And, and you know, it, it's a thing, right? Just uh, people get this and they need to know what, what's happening. And it's one page, so it's obviously not everything, but it, we, we um, talked a lot about prioritizing what would go in here and so we'll be in here going forward and then the second thing um, and this will involve sharing so bear with me but um, internally we wanted to create a new brochure um, what we do now and can you online see my screen and this cover page yes I can see it thank you okay so Right now, um, and, and a lot of you know this, you know, for the public, they come in and if they're at any service point, we always have a paper calendar of events. Right. That's great. People love it. They take it home. They ask for it. Um, I wanted something where someone can grab one thing that has all the calendars of events, but also promotes other um, things going on in the library. So our wonderful marketing person, um, worked with us in the programming committee and made this brochure which should be out in fact it should be delivered here I think next week Tracy right because we put in the order for professional printing services so this will have this is almost like our own little library specific rec guide you can see my magazine again anyway but it's just for the library they convinced that I should have a little from the director, which I Absolutely. resisted yeah. completely, no. but yeah. whatever. Um, <laughs> so it, it's there, yeah, and that might have been partially ghostwritten, anyway. but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we have really good stuff here, like what's new, everything, a lot of stuff's QR coded. Um, you can just see the how this is going to look. So it'll be sort of like a little booklet, right? Mm -hmm. Someone can grab from any desk, we'll of course take it to outreach. This is stuff that's coming up starting pretty much in January. Um, and I'm not expecting you to read all this. I'm, I'm going down so that you can kind of see when we get to the calendar point. And what you can't see as you see this represented in the PDF here is that the calendars in this little magazine will be perforated and you can tear these out and put them on your fridge or whatever. Whatever people do with these things. <laughs> How often would this come out? Um, every, about quarterly kind of in line with the rec guide. Um, so this goes through, I think, April. So this is something new we're, we're starting now. Um, and again, a, a, a direct result of forming this committee, circling back to the action plan. So this is an outcome of that that I think is really beneficial and positive. And I'm just a real fan of streamlining stuff that we produce out of here pieces of paper with calendars and bookmarks and I'm just like it makes me like nauseated a little bit so I just I like things neatly packaged and everyone gets everything they need in one thing um, and it looks professional is the other thing not that the paper calendars I mean they are what they are and they're useful but something that people look at this and think they're getting something from you know a, a professional organization not just Printouts from someone's copy machine. I love this, John. Jamie, I'm wondering if you're going to ask the same thing I am. Go for it. Who's paying for this? We are. Okay. So it's coming out of the library budget? Yep. Yeah. So is there something else you have to let go in order to make this happen? Well, because um, <clears throat> printing ain't cheap. It, no, it's not cheap, and neither is the one page in the rec guide, by the way. So. I planned enough to get through this year, which maybe isn't the smartest thing I've ever done. But I will figure it out next year. We have a budget for this. We have a budget that covers like advertising and marketing, and we haven't really always tapped into it. So let me start there. So there, it, we don't always expend that. But this will go quickly. So are we going to have to give something up? Maybe, maybe not. We have some other budgetary items if we get into the details that are kind of older items that have been in place for years that we never use. Like we used to send magazines to a bindery and have things bound, oh, yeah. like a college mm -hmm. or a university would, mm -hmm. but we still have that line item. Mm -hmm. So it's really, some of this is a matter of reallocating, mm -hmm. like the money's there, it's just, not in the right place. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not exactly concerned about that or that something has to go in order to make this happen. And are there restrictions because we're the city, are there restrictions on, say, taking in uh, revenue from sponsorships, community sponsorships, uh, like ads? Well, the rep guide has it, I'm pretty sure. Those aren't free, those are paid. Placement? That's a good question, and now I don't see any ads. I'll look into that. I, you know, I can't speak for here because I haven't done it. Because if you can, at one of my last organizations, we definitely sold ads for sponsors, and that in this case could pay for it. Easy, especially for the library one. I can't really control the rec guide. Right. That's really controlled by others. I just thought it was good to be in there because the museum's been in there for a while. Yeah, library would be. It just doable. makes sense. My next thing is I'm going to try to convince my boss to rename the rec guide the recreation and culture guide. Mm -hmm. Now that culture's in there, but you choose your battles and you pick your timing. We've only had one page so far. <laughs> right? So anyway, um, that's something I'll explore actually, Jamie, because I think that we probably could do something like that. And if something we produce like that looks that good, I think someone would want to be in there mm -hmm. and be a part of the library in that way. And it builds community partnerships. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to it. 
So um, let me, um, I'll stop that for now so I'll go back to seeing everybody. Um, okay, a couple other things related to the action plan. So the, we wrote a new um, computer use policy, which this library didn't have. It's pretty standard. Um, I probably should have thought to either bring that or put it in the packet, but I can do that next time. It's, the, the group that did it really looked at a lot of other libraries. We had some form of that here before, so it's not exactly a new invention, but it kind of fell off and it needed to be revised. Um, we needed something um, with the amount of computer use we get, you know, just things that come up and, you know, how much time you get on a computer and, and privacy things and what the library is responsible for or not. So I, I will try to remember to share that here next time, but um, it's like a one pager. It's gone through the city attorney's office here and it was fine um, with uh, very minor tweaks and it's publicly available as far as printed, like for people who come in. It will be on our website in the policies section um, when our marketing person gets back from her um, vacation. So that's done, just keeping updating on policies uh, was another goal this year. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to action plan, I had a good productive meeting with the school district um, with a project that's been going on long before I got here on student IDs and importing those into uh, to work as library cards effectively. And I kind of just jumped in after a while because it wasn't moving and realized there were some complications in there and, and some assumptions that were not correct and which I think was causing it to not really move forward. So I, and, and, and also, um, including myself, um, all the players have changed. <laughs> so the person from the school district, um, Susie, I didn't know him, the person's name was Zach something, you probably know who I'm talking about, but um, came up with this idea at some point and um, everything's in place. There's an MOU between the city and the school district. We've done test runs of importing student IDs into our system. Right. The glitch was um, the district, at least at that time, and maybe still currently felt they needed, well, they do need, I shouldn't say felt, they need parental permission because of getting library access. Um, but where I came in was proposing the idea of how much access is needed, and therefore could it be more of an opt-out rather than an opt-in, you know, which is a little bit easier. And it's something I did successfully previous to here when I was in Englewood, we didn't import anything other than the ID. In fact, we didn't have a student name or anything. Um, we, we just called them like student one, student two, so that they could have access to all our databases and everything they would need. Um, and if they wanted a library card, they would come in just like anybody else, but it was an easy conversion. Mm -hmm. So we made some progress in that meeting. Um, I helped contribute to a document that they started to describe the benefits and the whys, kind of in a way starting over a little bit now that there's new players and maybe rethinking how it's approached, particularly through the school district, understanding there's a lot of things they have to consider with um, parents and what they know, what their students are doing or not, um, understandable. So I think we're getting a lot closer now. Mm -hmm. That won't happen before the end of the year, obviously, but um, we'll see. We'll see, That's that document and, and the MOU is gonna be taken back to some people within the district to talk about and bring that back forward and, and see what, if anything else, is needed in order to move this forward. And I think in particular, from the school district's aspect is can we do this as an opt-out? Um, not having worked in schools, but I think that would be a lot easier, right? If they have access unless you say no, right? So, and I think this, the district has decided, or almost decided, that this would make a lot more sense to start with just high school students, um, because they already don't have limited access to library materials. Currently, the, the school district 
has access to ebooks through Libby through a program called Sora, which I'm sure many of you know about. And if you are in middle school or below, it, it restricts access to what you can borrow, which, which is good for a lot of people, but the high school students don't have that restriction. They have the full collection. So it takes, if we just do high school at least to start, it, it takes away any conversation about should they not have access to this A versus B versus C versus D. Oh, that sounds really promising. Um, I think all of these updates are both important and promising. Uh, John, I also just want to, I mean, you, you've been here a year. Like, this is a lot of progress across the board. So, um, great job. Uh, thank you for those updates. I, I think they're all wonderful. The who's, district. Who's what? Who's going to pay for this? Uh, is there a cost associated with this project? There's not any cost. I mean, there's staff time cost, but there's not like a, an actual, someone has to pay anybody. Okay. It's a matter of an agreement that we can take in certain data points of students and import it into our system. Cool. Good question. And just one last thing on the action plan. I've met with my leadership team because here we are in December. I see you, Catherine. Anyway. Um, of next year. So we had some conversations. I proposed at this point that at least within the library they go back to their departments, children, adult, tech, and CERC, talk within there and think about goals they have for next year. Um, however, I'm also um, thinking about doing a, a larger strategic planning process, which I've mentioned here before, but within the city, the museum had a pretty successful experience doing this with our very own assistant city manager, Sandy Cedar, and they felt really good about, they just spent a day on planning for their next few years. So that could impact whether we actually have an action plan or strategic plan, but regardless, we're starting to think about it. Um, yeah, I just had two thoughts about the school piece. Are you aware of any student groups that have been like involved in that conversation? Student groups? I'm not aware. Okay, because I just like I know in our school we have a National English Honor Society, and you know I think they might be get kind of excited about the idea of library cards and promoting library access and you know you might be able to get some more support that way too you know um, yeah. and then um, has there been any like in terms of parent pushback or parent concern has that been primarily in like elementary conversations or I'm just curious no so basically you know when this all came into place and they started some testing the, the district decided to do some like a test pilot program right to test the importing of the data and whatever but they they still needed parental signatures and they chose a couple of middle schools um, one was here in Longmont I don't remember which one and the other one was in Erie okay. um, and they were basically having trouble getting parents to respond so like the response rate was low like and part of that that I learned too through some of these conversations is there was like a period of time where they could respond to this request to allow access and then when that period ended there was no option to just like you couldn't come in later and just say oh yeah I want my kid to have this they had a period of time where they were allowed to do that I'm not sure how they came up with that I think they in me being in a couple of meetings, I think, from what I can tell, they've talked about that process and maybe, particularly if they move to opt out, I don't think they need to have a time frame. But it gets into yeah. rules of, of school districts and things like that that I just don't know of how they come to that stuff. Um, so it, there was no elementary school involved. I don't think they have any intent of involving elementary schools at this time for, mm -hmm. for something like this. But. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of like the role of parents in that conversation. And, um, I mean, yeah. 
I've been on both sides of that. I've had my kids bring home books that I'm like, oh, okay, we're not reading that right now, or we're going to read that together, you know? But then, of course, I'm also a huge advocate for students having access to the library. So yeah. I think it's, you know, it's complicated in many ways when kids are very young, for sure, and then it evolves. Um, right. But and I think, you know, in, in this case, it's, you know, the, the primary goal, and because all students get a device, I don't know what they get these days, they either get a tablet or a laptop or something, but, and, and so they, they have what they need to access digital resources. And there still is, you know, an aspect there of parenting of what's in there, right? You know, I mean, you, you can search for, you could be doing a paper on breast cancer research and find all kinds of stuff in EBSCO that I'm sure some parents wouldn't like. But, you know, it's just, it's a reality of, uh, of what's in there and, diff you know, there's differing opinions. But when it comes to physical collection, this particular model doesn't give them instantaneous access to our physical collection. That still requires parent, parent or guardian signature in order for them to check out physical materials. So it still comes back to how the public library functions, which is the parent or guardian's responsibility for that, but we also won't allow it without that. Digital's a little different, but there's also, if we either have the opt-in or opt-out from the school district, then the parent has either agreed or not that their student can access it, so you kind of cover it that way as far as what you might, what a student might access. But again, if it's only high school at the beginning, I think there's a lot less concern. Not that there wouldn't be some parents concerned, but I don't know, at some point, <laughs> as a public librarian, it's like, I don't know, I mean. It seems to be close instead of the opt out. Yeah. I hope possible. that that's how they move, but. Yeah, I don't know how those AP classes, especially the research, junior and senior year one, do it without scholarly resources. I don't know, and I, I feel like the, the district, at least from what I can tell, they're fairly limited in what they are able to provide their own students. So I mean, it's just it's a partnership that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, John, for those updates. Yep. And just to circle back quickly to the beginning, I think that sounds wonderful that y'all are also thinking about uh, restrictions to service populations and challenges. Um, seems like that's a really important conversation to be had as well. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on, and let's we'll continue with John uh, giving the report from uh, any updates from last month. Um, I'll just share our programming highlights, which I like to do. It's a nice positive aspect <laughs> of everything that still goes on here. Um, what I what I've named our monthly highlights, right? So um, just going through. There we go. Um, so some really good stuff in November. Um, a lot of crafty things coming out of, um, I'm sorry, this is children and teen if you didn't catch that. Um, um, literally making hats and gloves. Um, this, I was gonna comment if um, Katie was here, because she was here with her daughter for this program. Came out with some jar of something very sugary looking that looked terrible, but they had fun. They had fun, that's what matters. Um, <laughs> not for me. Um, the, the tween stuff is, is still going strong, as you can see here. Um, um, our, and then the teen programming stuff, so we're, we're getting good stuff here. I mean, when you get 15 kids coming to Dungeons and Dragons every other week. I mean, that's I, I'm I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's that bi-weekly one here. Um, so this continues to grow. Of course, part of that's because we have this teen library that started last year, so it's getting um, stronger as we go. Um, we do a lot of passive programming in kids, so things that don't involve staff that people can just come in and do. So I'm sure some of you maybe have experienced this those of you that have kids. Um, some numbers here, so um, just a little bit of data. Um, so if you look at programs, um, 52 programs and over 1,200 attendees just in November. That's the kind of stuff we're doing. You can see why it's 
sometimes I worry about how much we're doing. Um, adult programs. Um, had a really good author come in. I'm not sure if anyone was able to go to that. I was not, but it was really popular. We actually had two authors. We had a second one on climate change. This conversation was really good. So the first one brought in over 50. This one brought in almost 50 people for adult an adult program. Um, um, and pretty highly received. Our ongoing groups really successful. Um, and then some numbers here. So all these different programs and then totaling almost 200 in attendance for adult, which is pretty good, actually. They don't do, which is normal, near the programming that, that kids and teens generally do. And then good old outreach, um, doing their usual, the park visits, that'll die down a little bit here in the winter. You know, um, uh, this is uh, Lillian, who I refer to often here. So. She has a couple of programs at parks. In the winter, she'll plan on it, but if it's looking like bad weather, she'll cancel it. She's actually talking with someone who might be willing to donate space in the winter so we can continue it on an indoor space. Um, so that's other, other stuff Lillian does in the background besides just delivering the program itself. Um, but, you know, we've actually had some nice days here <laughs> this winter, so um, much to my pleasure, I love it. Anyway, so, um, and then this is um, at uh, PI, Parents Involved in Education, which is, I talked about a few meetings ago, really developed into a full-blown outreach program. It used to be basically babysitting. Now, they did yoga last week, one of the other, the, the time before, the month before, they did um, something with anime arts. So, it's just, it's turned into something really fantastic. Um, and a, a lot of attendance here, and just, it's really good. But Lillian's very proud of it, and I'd like to see that. Um, just another slide from that. She's really good about reporting these with pictures, by the way. Um, Intercambio, who Lillian connected with, so they're coming into the library a lot more than they ever used to. Uh, maybe at all, actually. Um, as a result of one of her outreach, at Timberline, and that Timberline outreach, I think was, I can't remember what the program was there, but this is what happens um, when Lily goes out a lot. So this family was there, never been to the library, never has been to the library. But because of her um, going, they wanted to come, and they connected with her, so they got a personalized one-on-one -on -one tour, which Lillian does often, and no less than an hour or two, and just, going in depth on everything that's here. And of course, in most cases, um, just as with this family, you know, largely Spanish speaking, so that's also where it's a true benefit. And that's why we have that role, to connect with that population who really wants to learn, but needs to have that support and understanding in their own language. Just really good. I mean, this is just one family of many that this happens. Um, but I love that she captured this. Um, if any of you were here for the tree lighting, that was pretty well attended. Lily was there reading stories and doing all kinds of stuff that night. Um, so a couple photos from there. And then uh, this is everything that happened um, in November. Still a lot for a winter month. Um, December will be a lot less just because it's December. And Lily and um, she spends the last couple weeks in December back with her family in Mexico, so, um, which is just fine. It's, it's not the month to really be out there a lot <laughs> in the end. Um, you know, so this is how many, this 649 is how, I've talked about this before, that's how Lillian tracks just interactions with people, any interaction that she has had. Um, but they're real interactions, it's not just I waved at you, it's she talked to somebody about the library. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very real number um, of what's going on there. And overall in November, you know, over 750 people that she talked to just in that month alone. Um, so, you know, I'm a broken record, but you can see why outreach is a priority for me. Um, so that's that, that's my, 
only addition to everything I've been blabbing about for the last whatever, but that's my director's report. Okay, thanks, John. I, I'm so glad that, first of all, Elaine's taking a vacation. Um, yeah. And second, that I, I think I understand why quantitative data is important, but I don't ever want to pin success based on numbers, so it's yeah. so wonderful to have the pictures and the stories as well that really speak to like the true yeah. successes okay. there. Um, any questions for John on the updates? All right, let's move on to friends. But before I pass it off to Jamie, I did want to share, Jamie, if you don't mind, they steal your thunder here, uh, had the wonderful idea of making sure that this group thanks the friends for, for their work from the advisory board. So we have, I have letters to each of the friend board members um, that I can pass to you to sign in a moment. However, what I could also do is leave them at the right at the CERC desk or, or wherever it would make sense. Pat and Rihanna, if y'all would be coming by in the next few weeks, we could do that uh, if you wouldn't mind just signing these. But I was if, imagining I would bring them on Wednesday. Was never that mind. Not, no, no, that works. Okay. I wasn't I'm sure sorry. when the meeting was. Um, don't worry about it. We could do it at the January meeting. No, let's just do it now. Instead. It's the holidays. Uh, we'll just, Jamie and I will just sign these. I think that works. Um, and I, I wrote on behalf of the Longmont Library Advisory Board, so it's coming from all of us. Um, I'm happy to forge anybody's signature. <laughs> you can we send it like digitally. Yes, I. Can stick it to me. Okay, so. Is it now? Yeah. Um, so I'll pass off the the uh, update to you, and you uh, you can sign these. Maybe, maybe we'll split these. Um, oh, they just need a name. They just need your name on them. I read them all. So. Okay. Thank you for doing yeah. that. I was all ready to nope. order some cards, and there's just one, yeah, one, you're one less thing on my list. One, one thing fewer, I should say. Um, so, yes, the December book sale. I understand that this is the first time, at least in a long time, that the friends have done a December sale. So there was a little bit of an experimental angle to it. I think, uh, at least in recent history, they were doing maybe three sales a year, and it was like roughly beginning of the year, springtime, and then, and then that fall time. Um, what we all observed in volunteering this weekend, this was started Wednesday night for Friends members, Wednesday evening, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the sale was running during library hours. Um, we took in less money than we had been. Um, and so there was a question about, you know, is the, the market saturated right now? Is this one sale too many? Is it timing related? Might this sale have brought mo more folks in during a different time? Um, maybe it was, you know, when fewer things are going on in people's lives or the weather is different. Um, I know that the board is going to be looking at those numbers and having those discussions in the next few meetings. Um, they have their dates already picked out for 2024 and they made bookmarks already and those dates uh, suggest that there will be four sales again in 2024 so the friends are at least committed to doing four sales next year and then 2025 you know remains to be seen um, I believe another angle that they will be exploring is maybe at least one of those sales is more specialized. So instead of having four sales that are pretty much the same, um, you might have one sale that's just paperbacks, or you have one sale that uh, would be more geared toward children, and maybe could be paired with some programming uh, to have a, a full, robust children's event that would bring folks into the library. So those things are to be determined. Um, pricing, I think they'll be looking at, 
I've only been volunteering with this group for the past maybe year and a half. Um, and pretty much every sale, somebody suggests raising prices for these used books because it is definitely the best game in town, uh, especially on the last day of the sale when it's $5 a bag day. Um, the bags that are used are uh, certainly bigger than they, they've been in some, uh, some sales last year, they, they purchased some paper bags with uh, branding, Friends of the Library logo, and um, so that's a little bit of outreach or, or brand awareness, but also they hold more than the flimsy plastic bags that were, you know, single-use stuff that it's, yeah, there's just not, a, not good on a lot of fronts. Um, I did field a question from a Friends board member that I would like to get back to them on, and that was uh, someone had been asking this board member, um, if I make a donation and I want it to go to the library specifically, um, do I send it to the library or do I send it to the city? And so the board member's understanding was that they should make a donation to the city and then it would go into the general fund and earmarked fund. I mean, I have my suspicions, but I want to be able to give them reliable information. My question was, why aren't they donating to the friends? Yes. <laughs> I have an answer. Oh, you have an answer? <laughs> okay. Um, the best way for that is to donate to the friends. It, it, it directly comes to the library. That's our only source of money that there is in no way the city can touch if it's in the library fund. Right. The library fund is the friends money basically. I mean there's other forms of donations that can come in there. That's like the easy, wouldn't, I'm looking at Tracy. Yeah, but I think that's the sense. easiest route. If yeah. you write it to the to the Longmont Library of the city, it it's just a little more wishy-washy in my mind. The Friends is the best route. That that was my instinct, so I will confirm that with them. Yeah. Um, it's cleaner. It's it's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's fine for this to go on the record, but you know I I still remain concerned and and for myself will continue speaking with this group about um, their efforts to increase membership and their efforts to increase non-sales and non-membership related revenue. In other words, an annual campaign, Colorado gives, um, other solicitations throughout the year. I, I think that those to, to do significantly more work in either of those two areas will require more capacity than they currently have. They are really good at doing those sales and it, it sure takes a lot to pull them off each and every time. Uh, I just don't think that they have the bandwidth to take on more energized membership and development initiatives um, and that frustrates and bothers me. That's all. I, I, I wish for their ranks to grow and expand with many you know different generations of volunteers and then they could have people you know assigned to all sorts of different tasks. Very grateful to them for all of the work that they do. 100%. And if there are any questions from this group that I can either try to answer or take back to the friends, I'm happy to do that. I think having a um, mutually uh, respectful and congenial relationship between library staff 
the advisory board and the friends not only is crucial, but it's very new. It feels very new. Um, I think there was maybe some past drama that is now really past. Um, and we can uh, move forward being more collaborative with one another. Thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate your kind of keeping an eye out for sustainability, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, for, I, I, yeah, I, I would love this board to make sure that the friends, or I'd love the friends to know that how much this board appreciates their efforts, um, as well as library staff. And that also made me think, Catherine, I know a couple of years ago you had set up a kudos board for some of the library staff. Maybe it's something we can do again in the spring. Um, just because I want to make sure they realize that as well. Um, and I, I did have a question. I guess this would be for John. I was looking back in the notes. We had somebody come in, like maybe it was late spring, talking about a specific bank account. Like that there was now a way to have funds earmarked. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Happy holidays as well. Um, it seemed like there was somebody who came in and was talking about there's now a way to have funds earmarked specific to the library. Am I just mis completely misremembering this? Okay, don't, I was, if somebody jumped on that, I was gonna say great. I might be, it might just be in my head. Um, so I will look back in the notes and see if I have imagining things. Um, okay, I think I just made that up. Because um, I didn't find it in the minutes either. <laughs> great, any questions for Jamie about the friends? Okay, Susie, do you have any updates to share? Um, yeah, so tomorrow we'll be voting on or finalizing the selections or appointments for boards and commissions. And you know, as you know, we didn't, <laughs> I don't think there, were there any openings this round? Not for No. Me. It'll be June, correct? I know the museum, I believe, is on to the museum board, and they did have openings, but nobody applied. Mm. So what challenges that we're dealing with is getting people to apply to these boards and commissions. And, you know, I I see things posted on Facebook, um, you know, the applications, and it could be, you know, maybe I'm looking for them or because I already have those, you know, the city page already liked and um, things, so it shows up on my feed. Um, but oftentimes we hear, well, I didn't know about it, I didn't know about it. So, you know, just trying to get that communication out to people, as well as something that I'm very passionate about is that access to language. So we have well, communities within our city who come in with a different perspective, but the barrier is language. So I think about a lot of my parents, their first language is Spanish. They can speak English, they can understand English, but to have a meaningful conversation it's it's very challenging they prefer you know to be able to to get to that higher order thinking and, and critical thinking you know folks feel more comfortable expressing that in their primary language so something how can we um, bridge that gap so we can get a more diverse pool of applicants in our um, in our board on our boards and commissions um, you know, at this point, I'm like, I'm now, I'll just be happy if people apply. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, that's something we're, we're looking through and, and working out to kind of expand that and get more of a, a diverse pool. I really liked, um, in the senior center, we actually have, um, you know, some folks coming, you know, folks coming in with, um, one is not, her language is not, is not predominantly English, but she participates in, the senior services and um, so we had we do have a few BIPOC um, applicants who came in but it was interesting like looking at some of the folks that have lower socioeconomic who are wanting to engage but you know because we're on zoom it was it was really evident the lack of technology mm -hmm. you know one all in and the other one had trouble with the technology piece getting the app and and doing all this. So it's it's really interesting how we expect people to conform to our structures and how we do business rather than 
us making those arrangements or changes to, to accommodate people and meet them where they're at. So that's that's something that that is ongoing. Uh, and I saw a hand up. Is that the whole, all of you all? I think it's John. Oh, it's John. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't. I don't know how that shows up on the other side. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I just wanted yeah. to say quickly, you know, when it comes to that kind of like uh, digital literacy or digital like navigation, digital navigating, library can play a huge role in that. We already do. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we we already. I mean, we have a program of that in place, not for that sp particular purpose, but. Um, we do uh, a class once a month, and it's specifically we have a Spanish instructor come in, and, and it's for basic computer skills for non-English speakers, I mean particularly Spanish speakers, but, um, and there's a whole um, statewide grant currently being written for a whole digital navigator program to be implemented statewide, um, and I'm on a committee in Boulder County that's a part of that to talk about that. So Longmont already does some stuff there in that besides the library. Anyway, I, I just want to, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to you more about that, but wow, I'm just thinking to get more engagement on this level, you know, we, we can definitely play a role in that to help people, with, whether they're on the library board or any other board or commission. No, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And finding ways to you know, to bring different departments together and kind of have, you know, what, what we all are doing here at the library and how they can, can support others. Um, you know, and then tomorrow before council, we do have our um, boards and commissions updates. So council, all the liaisons we, we share out and I will definitely be sharing what we discussed here tonight. And the importance, I mean, there's so much room to have the library be an integral part in, um, you know, building that uh, bridge for people who linguistic, um, socioeconomic, you know, there's all these these avenues that we can you know, tap into the library resources. We just need to fund it better. So I'm going to keep, keep I'm going to keep pounding. You know, maybe one of these days it'll. <laughs> What is it they say that, how, how long does the person have to hear the same message before they're all like, oh, I have it. Yeah, that's fun in library. <laughs> what is it? Seven. Seven? <laughs> we'll be past that. Yeah, uh, seven. Yeah, seven or a million, somewhere in there. Well, they also have yeah. to hear it in different places. Yeah. Different yeah, people. yeah. Different people as well. So, um, yeah, I think you know that that was kind of the the big thing we're we're looking at right now. We have our new council member Diane Chris, who's on board. Um, we did make our appointments for uh, liaison, so I'll still be on the library. Um, if y'all have me, so <laughs> you gotta pick up your game, woman. Um, and um, I will also be part of the. Um, I'll continue on at the museum as well as the arts and public places. Cool. So I kind of think that that might be a cool way to kind of link those. Yeah, you got all the well. cool stuff. Yeah. Is it a fun one because it sounds like. Thank you so much, Susie. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you're continuing as our, as our liaison because I think it takes a little bit of time to get someone up to speed on the functions of the library and the value of the library. So we really, I think next year, We'll be leaning on your your advice and expertise on, on how to spread this message um, more effectively. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Any questions for Susie on that update? All right. Well, our next standing item is library profession news. The notes again. That's just to share if there's anything happening in the greater world of libraries in Colorado, the U.S., or beyond. I have nothing. <laughs> I am so ready for the semester break that my mind has not been thinking about the big picture of libraries recently, besides this one. Um, anyone else have anything from the world of library news they want to share? Hmm. Okay, well, at this point, I'll open up to any other library board comments. Okay, well, um, 
Thank you all so much. Our next meeting is January 22nd, 2024. And I will call this meeting at 841.